Pleasure to be joined by John Meacham, a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and author of the new book, The Soul of America, coming to uh, Warwick's in La Jolla uh, just after the California primary, conveniently uh, enough. Uh, and, and I wanted to start just with the name uh, of the book, the, the Soul of America. What, uh, what got you inspired to, to write a book on that topic? Well, the events in Charlottesville last summer when the president failed to decide which side he was on between neo-Nazis and Klansmen and, and or, ordinary uh, right-thinking Americans. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. And I thought, we need to figure out exactly where we are as a country and as important where we've been. Uh, have there been moments in the past that have felt like this one, that have felt uh, divisive, contentious, difficult, insuperable even? And the answer is yes. Uh, my own view is that the soul of the country is one where you have the Ku Klux Klan on one side and Martin Luther King on the other really fighting it out uh, in any given era. And that's the perennial struggle we'll, we're still part of. Do you find uh, when, when you get a chance to, to meet people at signings, and, and I know you get asked on television all the time, you say the answer is yes, we have seen uh, times <laughs> like this in our history. Do you find people are, are thirsting to get some kind of some kind of comfort from, from our nation's history? Well, if not comfort, at least proportion. Uh, I do think people are interested in, in perspective in trying to figure out exactly where this fits. Uh, is it uniquely uh, challenging or is it challenging, but we've been in similar situations before and what can we learn to get out of this situation? What are, are, are some of the examples that, that you cite that are maybe the, the closest to, to the political climate of the modern day? Well, there are two, really. One is uh, basically the 1915 to 1925 period when the second Ku Klux Klan was dominant in American politics. Three to five million Americans belonged to it. 50,000 Klansmen marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1925. There were 347 delegates to the Democratic National Convention in 1924 who were Klansmen. Uh, and it was a period of anti-immigrant sentiment of anti-Semitic sentiment, anti-Catholic sentiment, obviously anti-African-American uh, sentiment. And it was a period where uh, the country was really grappling with, would we be true to that Jeffersonian assertion of equality, or were we going to exclude people from the mainstream? The other period is really 1950 to 54, which is the Joe McCarthy era, uh, the communist uh, hunts, where you had a politician who dominated the culture, who understood new media, who understood that if you if someone said something about you, you didn't really respond to it, you just punched back. And the punch was all in many ways. And so I think that in, in a lot of ways, uh, President Trump is most like Joe McCarthy. It's interesting that you, you reference new media, because um, obviously we are in, in a, a, a time of new media. Can you uh, expand a little bit on, on kind of some of those similarities to uh, that you see from what McCarthy did to, to uh, current social media? Sure. You know, people think that, well, social media, cable news has made this a uniquely difficult period in which to communicate clearly, in which to get facts out as opposed to opinion. But, you know, we had a partisan newspaper culture in this country in the 18th, 19th and into the 20th centuries. Uh, radio and television were phenomenal forces. In many ways, television helped make McCarthy and also brought him down because the more people saw him, the more people understood that this was not who we should be. And my own view is that ultimately, uh, if this presidency ends badly, it will in part be because the president has stuck with what has worked for him in the past. That is uh, a constant struggle, a constant sense of strife, attack, attack, attack. And the question is, will the national patience uh, ultimately wear out? Uh, historically, how did the tide begin to turn against McCarthy? A couple of things. Uh, we had uh, the Senate finally began to, to wake up. A woman named Margaret Chase Smith, senator from Maine, Republican senator from Maine, gave a speech in 1950, really laying out the case against McCarthy. She only got six co-signers at that point. It took the men about four years to catch up, and the, the Senate ultimately uh, censured McCarthy. Uh, the other element had been the press. Uh, Edward R. Murrow, the great World War II correspondent, did a, a famous broadcast in early 1954 where he simply let McCarthy speak. 
Uh, he showed clips of, of the McCarthyite attacks, and it had a remarkable effect because people seeing it all in one place realized that this is not who we wanted to be. People who are, are opponents of, of the current president and the political time are trying to figure out the best way to, to counter him or, or to, to rally uh, the public. We see uh, all, all of us who are reporters cover protests uh, all the time, uh, you know, particularly yeah. Daryl Issa's uh, district here, which was the closest uh, race in, in 2016. Uh, have there been times in our history that, that folks who are getting politically activated now would look back at for uh, for inspiration or, or at least as examples of making a difference? Yeah, the protests of the 1960s, uh, which were so dramatic, uh, both in favor of civil rights and against the war in Vietnam, uh, are models of remarkable public pressure, uh, young people getting engaged. And also, and I think this is important, it took a long time. Uh, reform is a difficult and painful business. We've only been, we're only a half century away from functional apartheid in my native region in the South. We're not quite at the century mark of women having the right to vote. We're only 150 years away from in, in, in a, a country that enslaved huge portions of its citizens. Now, saying only 150 years may sound, you know, in this cycle may mm-hmm. sound oxymoronic, but in the eye of history, it's, it's, it's not that long. And so, it, you know, McCarthy, as I said, took four years to get from 1950 to 54. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, the break in at the Watergate uh, Hotel was uh, June 17th, 1972. Uh, Nixon didn't leave office until August 9th, 1974. It took 26 months. Uh, the war in Vietnam continued despite massive protests. Uh, the struggle over civil rights took decade after decade after decade. So uh, while it's difficult to say be patient, uh, ultimately patience is an element of the work of reform. Uh, I'm curious about your perspective on um, on the importance of voting and people's attitudes towards voting in this yeah. country. I, I meet a lot of young people when I'm, I'm out covering stories day to day, and it's amazing how many uh, how many you know, teenagers and, and young Americans I meet who are uh, who are now passionately, uh, you know, activated or, or woke, as, as they might say. But it's right. also amazing how many kids I meet who uh, who are apathetic to the, the voting process and to the political process. Is, is that something that's been common in our history? Yeah. Uh, one of the virtues of democracy is that uh, enough people at various points have participated to keep the enterprise going. But cynicism about the institutions of politics, the traditional institutions, is uh, an ancient theme in American life. Hard to, to meet people, particularly at book events, not necessarily from, from reporters. What do people want to know from you? What, what are the questions that you're being asked? Two questions always come up. One is, has it ever been this bad? And the answer is yes. Uh, Fort Sumter was pretty terrible uh, in terms of division. And the other question is, how do we get out of it? And what I, the way we get out of it, I think, is we have conversations like this. Uh, we, we try to form dispositions of heart and mind that will encourage our better angels to prevail for a given period of time. And my view is that history tells us we have to stay in the arena. We have to fight these battles uh, as dispiriting and tiring as it can be. You got to follow the tweets. You know, you have to know what you're up against. Uh, we need to resist tribalism. Picking one team and then deciding the other team, no matter what happens, is wrong. We have to listen to each other a little bit more. There has to be an ability to say something good about the bad guys and bad about the good guys. That's just that's that's an essential element of, of democracy. And I hope we can find a, a sense of letting history shape us, letting the past give us proportion, give us some patience and inspire us to go to higher ground. The story of the country is one of remarkable reform, but it, it's not easy. For folks uh, who, are, who are thinking about heading over to Warwick's in, in La Jolla to, uh, to, to see you uh, and, and, and get an autograph, what can they expect from the event? Well, you'll hear a lot of what I just said, so ignore that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, what I find is that it's, it's, it's terrific to sit around and try to figure out uh, what applies and what doesn't. If you're worried about what's going on now, 
I think this book is important. It's the reason I wrote it. You know, this is this isn't going to pay for my retirement, unfortunately. Uh, but but I offered it. I, I'm offering it up as an argument for the moment, and not about Trump, but of Trump. And if you want to figure out how to negotiate our way through these stormy seas, I think this is a good conversation to have.